Hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you find yourselves today. I'm just letting everyone file in here. We have uh, quite an exciting lineup of panelists here joining us and a lot of registrants that will be joining this webinar. So I'm giving everyone just uh, one more moment to set up here and then we'll begin the webinar. All right, so thank you so much for everyone who's joined us so far and those of you that are still um, connecting. Um, my name is Melissa Colbert and I'm a science officer working on urban projects at Future Earth and I'm also the coordinator of the Urban Knowledge Action Network. So I'm very excited to welcome you all to the second Urban Knowledge Action Network webinar. Um, we're here today celebrating World Biodiversity Day. So happy World Biodiversity Day to all of you. I'm very excited to, to get us started and kick off this great lineup of speakers that have joined us here today. We have six panelists from various parts of the world that are going to um, talk about their work within this um, space, within the space of biodiversity and ecosystem conservation and preservation. Um, they'll be talking about the latest science to date and also a number of different initiatives and projects that they are driving that are a small but important piece of this global mission that we have to protect and conserve uh, biodiversity and ecosystems that are so essential um, to our livelihoods. So I'll start by introducing them all here and then um, we'll have Oliver Hillel who will join us uh, as the first presenter. So to introduce all six of them here right at the top, um, Oliver Hillel who is joining us from the Convention on Biological Diversity. There's also uh, Dr. Nikki Francisaki who's from Erasmus University in Rotterdam. Dr. Cornelia Krug who is a member of the Natural Assets Knowledge Action Network here at Future Earth and also based um, in the University of Zurich. Also joining us is Sophie Paradis, who is the Directrice du Québec of WWF Canada. Joshua Stack, who is a researcher and a practitioner from Stack Law, and he also teaches at SUNY University in New York. And last but not least, we have uh, Rob McDonald, Dr. Rob McDonald, who is a lead scientist uh, for the Cities Program at the Nature Conservancy um, in Washington. So I'm very excited to introduce them all. And I'll start by letting Oliver Hillel kick us off with the very first presentation. And as I am transferring him the presenter controls, I will let everyone in the audience know um, that we will be hosting a question period um, at the end of this webinar after the six uh, presentations. So please feel free if you have questions and comments for the duration of the webinar, please leave them in the chat box for me. I'll be moderating this and I'll be collecting them and picking them up at the end of the webinar. So Oliver, please feel free, take it away. You should have the controls and um, happy webinaring. Um, thank you. I do hope I have. Let me see if I do. I, I may need a little moment because I don't see exactly how I can move it. So unless I tell you to move it, maybe we could do it this way. Is that possible, Melissa? I think I see your uh, mouse moving, Oliver, um, on the screen. And exactly where should I click so that the next one comes? Would you point uh, that out to me? Are you in the... Is there, this? Your yes, your PowerPoint there, Oliver. You can just put it in uh, presenter mode and then just use the PowerPoint as normal. So you're not using the webinar um, interface right now, but just the normal PowerPoint. Okay. Wait a second, please. Not a problem. I think while Oliver is getting settled here, I was just sort of reflecting on um, how much time has really passed actually. So the International World Biodiversity Day was really um, set in 1992 by the United Nations. So this is this is about 25 years ago um, since this, this um, mandate has really been put in place with the CBD. So I'm very excited to have Oliver Hillel um, kick us off here. Oliver, are you um, ready? Um, Fortunately not. So again, can you please operate it for me? Yes, so I'll um, put it up on my screen here. It's just that I don't see the exact control on my screen where I can advance the, the, the maybe here, let me see. 
your, your screen is shared and then you can just use it through the um, PowerPoint presentation. And, and can you see what I'm clicking right now? I'm trying to advance it and nothing helps here. It doesn't go anywhere. Okay, not, not to worry, Oliver. I will uh, put it up here and then we'll continue from there. Okay. So Lisa, you you I am not sure what I'm seeing here. Let me make sure that I'm seeing this. No, funnily enough, I don't see the screen. Ah, yes, I do now. Do you see my screen now, Oliver? Yes, I do finally. Thank you. So good. Yes. Well, uh, thank you very much, and I'm so sorry for having caused this uh, slight delay. Um, I'm not it's a great pleasure to be here and I will definitely try to uh, stay within my eight minutes and there's a lot to speak. So I really welcome this opportunity. My name, as said, is Oliver Hillel and I work here in the secretariat of this multilateral convention uh, based in Montreal. And I'm very glad to be uh, contributing a few thoughts. So if you could move for the first slide. Uh, what, what I wanted to start with is to say that, you know, this is not only the day that was declared by the um, all the, the countries in the United Nations General uh, Assembly. What I see there is really we are in the context of a knowledge action network with an urban focus in one of the most relevant research and science policy interfaces that has uh, come up. So it builds on the long tradition of, of that kind of collaboration. So uh, what, what I'd like to say is that this is a space for us to co-create and somebody else is gonna talk about that later on. First, the good questions, then good answers. And then by generalizing that, coming up with solutions. And I think you will see on the right hand uh, of the slide, some of the so-called generating concepts that have come up uh, right now. Uh, it is clear, for instance, that people now look at uh, parks, for instance, for their wellness. It's a question of health, of feeling good. So that those um, are very powerful concepts, as well as biophilic cities. And uh, another colleague will talk about biomimicry and the, the understanding that cities are urban metabolisms. So this is uh, really uh, a lot of new concepts that we hope to explore in this particular knowledge action network. Uh, next one, please. So just quickly, the convention is, a, of course, an arrangement and an agreement between uh, national governments. It's 195 of them plus the European Union. And uh, well, why engage? Because those countries not only separately, they play a big role on how urban uh, expansion will happen and how people will manage and work with cities and live in cities over the next uh, couple of uh, tens of years and, and also in the shorter term, but also because their collective resources also bring to the table a lot of the private sector and other players. And it's a particularly open instrument compared to the others also because everyone is kind of friendly with biodiversity. So why engage us? Because we need scientists and uh, all the governments that have signed on to the convention say that they will respect scientific terms. It's all written in the convention. So there's an opportunity for that science policy uh, interface and uh, what we can achieve is simply the survival of humanity because without life and that I'm sure everyone else will be saying, we can't go on. To the right, I won't uh, remind you of every one of them, but those are some of the existing ways that the Knowledge Action Network can interact with us uh, or with the parties actually. I'm just you know, the keeper of the, the meeting room, so to speak. 
So there is many ways that, for instance, parties have already adopted a plan of action to deal with cities and, and to negotiate and to cooperate with subnational governments, provinces, states and prefectures and so on. And there's lots of other meetings and partnerships and projects and even uh, the, the part perspective of establishing uh, direct and re recognized bodies like an advisory committee that would then talk to parties whenever it is necessary or possible. Would you please get to the next one, please, um, Lisa? Thank you. So here, this, this slide is uh, intended to showcase a little bit what I meant uh, by unique situation. You know, we have a new urban agenda uh, that has unprecedented uh, understanding of, of the role of green growth, natural solutions, ecosystem, and even system-based approaches. Yeah, I want to just say that everyone today is talking about system-based approaches. The person who created that management system was a biologist. So here we go. Uh, you know, there's a task force that came out of the Quito Habitat Conference that has issued what I think is very relevant, guiding principles for another empowering concept, which is urban-rural linkages. There will be money in the upcoming Global Environmental Facilities seventh replenishment for a sustainable cities pilot by building on one that was more climate focused, but which has now clearly opened up to incorporate nature-based solutions and ecosystem approaches. Then there will be a lot of events over the next couple of uh, months, uh, starting in June here in Montreal with the ECLE World Cities Congress, going on to the Urban Biodiversity and Design Conference in Cape Town in September, which I definitely ask and, and suggest that, that um, K, the, the Urban K of, of Future Earth uh, group connect to that because we need that kind of network in the conference. And then, of course, the Conference of the Parties in Sharm el Sheikh in Egypt in November. And uh, obviously, we, we see great opportunities here. And I just want to leave that here that, you know, the next uh, host right now, we have Egypt, uh, which is very much involved in, in infrastructure development, particularly in links with some of the biggest projects, including the Belt and Road Initiative, a couple of trillion dollars over the next 10 years involving 65 countries about nothing but roads, uh, transportation ports and cities. So if we could somehow affect that kind in, in, in the, the knowledge action network is supposed to influence that kind of uh, trend. And, and I would just like to, to add that the convention is a good channel because China will host uh, the 15th conference of the parties in 2020 which is also the celebration of the 10th year of that plan of action, which all parties endorsed. So uh, yeah, Melissa, next one, please. Well, I won't go into that one because there's a lot of uh, opportunities open and uh, many of them will be approached by the people that uh, Melissa just introduced and that I am I'm just repeating uh, what I understood would be their main approach, but it will go on, on, on a lot of other things. I mean, I know that uh, uh, Rob will speak about a very exciting uh, project, and I know that uh, Joshua will speak about um, biomimicry and the preservation of rivers, and you know, how can uh, we learn from the experience of the natural assets knowledge action and think about nature-based solutions in general. But here on the left, I mean, is we are, you are, and, and I consider myself a part as a panelist here, 257 members at all levels, uh, combining researchers, practitioners, meaning here both in the private and the public sectors, and policymakers, those who actually influence the people who make decisions uh, in law and design and so on. And so uh, we can help de design questions because we know that that's the great first step for any science uh, policy advance. And then we know that this is in great need because in my very rough kind of rule of thumb calculation, something like 300 million people will be transiting from urban into, uh, from rural into urban settings in the next 12 years. 
and and there are great opportunities regarding the consumption and production control of those uh, 57% of humanity, particularly regarding the fact that today with the fourth industrial, and I think it's not just an industrial, but also a social revolution, we have unprecedented access by citizens and we can have the help of algorithms so that everything's going to change a lot. And I think this knowledge action network should be involved with the fusion and technologies and internets of things and blockchains and things like that as they affect uh, most of these sectors that also will influence diversity and as they also bring together the knowledge and the wisdom of a lot of people that was not possible before. So thank you very much for that. And I look forward to the next questions. If you could put the last uh, slide, it's just my uh, references and my thank you for listening to me. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for this, Oliver. Um, it's a great presentation. I think it's really important, especially um, with you being the representative from CBD, to really come out here and highlight some of the opportunities that exist for people that are participating in this Knowledge Action Network and that are interested in being in that space. So thank you so much for that. Um, moving on from Oliver, our next presenter will be Dr. Nikki Francisaki. And I will just take a moment here to transfer her the uh, presenter controls. And as I'm doing that, I'll just remind you all again that um, the chat box is open for those of you that have um, questions or comments that you want to list there for any of the presenters as we run through the panel. There will be a moment um, after each of the, uh, after all of the presentations to um, take up those comments and questions that are listed there. So Nikki, I think I've gone ahead and given you the control and you should be able to move the um, mouse and keyboard as well. Yes, um, I hope everybody can see my, my slides. Well, um, hello to everyone. Um, uh, thank you, Maclisa, for the great opportunity to bring us all together to have different voices and different inputs that can inspire uh, future action and future research on biodiversity. I work on more on the urban uh, side of things uh, with nature-based solutions for improving cities. And I'm going to change a little bit um, mode of thinking and mode of operations by taking it from Olivier to talk about the governance of nature-based solutions with a focus on co-creation. Um, more specifically, um, the reason why to look on governance and co-creation um, is exactly because what we want to have is actionable urban knowledge. We want the knowledge to actually improve the cities uh, of the future, the cities that we want to live in. And when we talk about co-creation is moving beyond the consultation model, moving beyond scientists talk truth to power or power hiring science uh, for already made decisions. It is about the active engagement with different types of knowledge on an equal basis uh, in order to generate collaborative outcomes that are openly defined. And these outcomes can be from agendas to vision narratives, to visuals, to new understanding of problems, to new knowledge that can actually progress city agendas and city making. And we have seen throughout Europe um, a number of different experiences with co-creation. Civil society has very frequently been overlooked um, as one of the actors that actually leads co-creation process. And in recent research, we found that there is a very fruitful and constructive interface between civil society, local governments and scientists that together they co-create on nature-based solutions. Um, I tried to move to the next slide. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay, here. And when we talk about nature-based solutions, we talk about solutions, systemic solutions that are inspired by nature, using nature and assisted by nature in terms of 
enhancing, restoring, um, and even creating uh, resource flows, water flows, biodiversity flows in cities, and also coping nature in doing this. So it can include, but is not only limited to biomimicry. Just biomimicry can be, you might say, a starting point. And there are a lot of examples and a lot of pilots that we already build and look up to in order to understand uh, how systemic uh, can be a nature-based solution. Okay, sorry. I have small difficulty on transition between slides. I'm sorry for that. Um, so taking it from there, what we have discovered from the evidence from research on nature-based solution is in order to have the multitude of ecosystem services being produced and delivered from nature-based solutions, it's very important to also include the social aspect. So in order to have the cultural ecosystem services, or as we say, the social ecosystem services, the co-production of them is of vital importance. So here comes why we advocate and why we believe that the co-creation is a mode of governance that can actually scale and mainstream and embed nature-based solutions. First, we have three key points that they come from uh, very recent research on mapping different experiences and different cases of nature-based solutions. First is that nature-based solutions, they do deliver climate services while ensuring well-being and social cohesion, but this only happens when they're actually co-produced. The second point is that nature-based solutions, when they actually co-create it uh, across different actors, they can instigate place transitions, meaning that they actually change meanings and sense of place for the communities uh, that they live with and they benefit from nature-based solutions, something that is really pivotal for inclusive urban regeneration. So don't only think of nature-based solutions as beautifying projects, but actually as projects with social importance. And we found this by looking on a number of urban regeneration projects, on looking on the context, the experimentation on co-creation that happened, and how this experimentation with co-creation created new form of narratives, iconic places in nature-based solutions, and new social relations that all together they actually transformed places into more livable, resilient um, places of present that can actually be icons for the future. And the third point here is that when nature-based solutions are co-created, then they are socially and institutional embedded. They are not anymore the add-ons in an urban strategy, but rather important um, strategies for creating new placemaking uh, projects and also for uh, enriching social learning, for activating and empower citizens to be active parts and have agency for, future, uh, for the future of cities. We have seen that in a lot of cities in uh, Europe and also have observed that through secondary data in cities in US, in Australia, and very recently also in Asia. To keep building our knowledge and sharing our knowledge on this, uh, we also um, want to share with you and present that we are going to have the Nature-Based Solutions theme group uh, within the urban can and that we would like to actually make it into a place to create a global community of research and practice, to share and wave knowledge globally and also to maintain this continuity of the knowledge and continuity of sharing the knowledge and mainstreaming it using the Future Earth platform. So for the people who participate, we're very happy to be in touch and to also include you in this nature-based solutions theme group. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Nikki, for the presentation. Um, following Nikki, we will have Dr. Cornelia Krug. And I'll just take a moment here to change um, the presenters. And as Cornelia is, is getting set up, I, I just wanted to comment, Nikki, here that I think it's it's great that your um, presentation has really illustrated that nature-based solutions are not just these sort of beautifying projects in cities, but they're also projects of real social importance and, and how co-creation is a sort of an active mechanism of how you can engage that society with these kinds of projects. So that was, that was very interesting. Um, Cornelia, are you ready to go ahead? Um, I think I am. You can see my screen, I hope. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> Okay, excellent. Um, yeah, and thanks, Nikki, actually, for your presentation. That was excellent to hear about all this. Um, so what I'm going to do is actually going to give you a quick um, overview over the Natural Assets Con. Um, compared to the Urban Con, we're actually not that well advanced yet. We only had our development team, our first development team meeting um, four weeks ago in Montreal. So we've been meeting to discuss where we should be going with the natural assets con where we think we can actually make an impact uh, and also at the moment we're thinking about um, trying to find funding to actually move some of the activities forward and i think there's some um, opportunities for joint activity the urban con as well so what I'm going to do now is just give you a quick overview over the Natural Assets Con and then end with like some of the ideas we had for activities. Yeah, and I'm yeah a member of the Natural Assets Con development team. I'm also the science officer for one of the Future Earth Global Research Programs, Biodiscovery. And I'm also based at the University Research Priority Program, Global Change and Biodiversity here at the University of Zurich. And uh, hello slide, there we go, there we go. So the action space of the Natural Assets Khan for us is on the one hand, um, the sustainable development goals, especially um, target 14 life below water and 15 life on land. But then we actually see ourselves um, interacting with different conventions um, different assessment bodies as well. And we're actually going to be building our science on most, if not all, of the global research programs or projects within Future Earth. So, because natural assets, I mean, the thing is, when you think about what natural assets are, it, it's a difficult concept to actually pin down. And that was actually the starting point for the natural assets can is actually first find out what what do we actually understand from, about natural assets and how does it actually help us to frame the work within a natural assets con and to achieve that end we had two workshops one in Bern, switzerland in september 2017 where we actually got together to different experts to think about what are the conceptual meanings of natural assets how can we actually develop this to to something that can encompass the work within the natural asset con and provide some kind of scaffolding for the natural assets. And then we had a follow-up workshop at the PECS Open Science Conference in Waka, Mexico at the end of last year, and actually presented that first um, draft concept of natural assets and actually thought about where do we actually need to go with science and society? Who do we actually need to bring together? And I just want to show you quickly how we actually understand natural assets because there's, as I said, a lot of different understandings and meanings behind it. So we're working, looking at the intersection between human needs and nature um, in a very broad sense. Now, we're not just thinking about biodiversity and ecosystem services, but also the um, abiotic components of the environment that shape um, that shape the environment. So we're thinking about the climate, the soils, but we also may be thinking about the natural resources um, that are available out there, the air, fresh water, etc. 
Um, when we're thinking about natural assets and we develop in our activities, we need to consider that processes are going to be running over longer time scales. They're very slow processes. We're looking at large scales. Um, we also need to have a holistic view, a systems view. We need to embrace the complexity of the natural world around us, but we'll be taking an anthropocentric view because we're thinking about how actually all this helps to support human needs. Be very aware when we when we try to tackle this, there are the very different epistemologies out there, different knowledge systems that we actually need to bring on board and that we actually need this transdisciplinary engaged research with key actors and stakeholders. And having that concept of natural assets actually also helps us towards the operationalization of, of activities and how we actually deal with it. So, so we're thinking about when we talk about natural assets and activities within the natural assets con is how can we actually take stewardship or custodians of all the elements of the biosphere that humans use, value, and depend on. Um, and then use different understandings, different knowledge systems. And I mean, um, Francesca, was, Nikki was actually talking about one of the natural based solutions and actually draw from these different approaches and methodologies to actually develop tools that link across those different knowledge systems. And that actually then help us to implement those activities um, working with different stakeholders. Um, in our last workshop of the workshop of development team, we actually then um, thought about the vision of that con, where do we actually want to go? And a key focus will be the, to highlight the role of natural assets for the continued health of our planet. And the work that we want to do is supposed to help in meeting the various global goals that have been set. So they are the um, Sustainable Development Goals. I've shown that at the beginning. They're also the IG biodiversity targets that have been set by the CBD um, in 2010, which are going to, well, kind of expire in 2020. And there's also the post IG target development process where we hope that our work will actually be able to like shape those future goals. In terms of activities, there's um, three things that we thought about that we should actually be doing. And the one thing is actually look at how you, what are the unintended side effects of implementing global goals to conserve natural assets or to conserve biodiversity. So if you, you have those big global goals under the IG biodiversity targets, for example, to protect 17% um, of the land surface, but what impacts actually does that have on a local socioeconomic and ecological context in achieving, trying to achieve those goals? Are there actually countries meeting um, the goals or are they actually having negative impacts because they they are because they're unintended side effects so if you put aside an area for for a nature reserve depending on how you do it you might actually displace people who might who then move somewhere else and then actually have a bigger negative impact on the environment and if you um initiated a different approach to conserving that area so that's the thinking that goes beyond, beyond number one the second one is thinking about the synergies that you can actually find between achieving, um, in particular, SDG 15, life on land, and other SDGs that are re relevant for sustainable development. It, it speaks also maybe a bit to number one, but thinking then again, how can we actually, in a conserving nature, how can we actually help achieve other goals, other sustainable development goals? Um, so we want to quantify and track the specific trade-offs among those different goals and then also have this understanding of temporal and spatial uh, change and interactions looking at global and local trade-offs. Again, um, 
it speaks a bit to number one as well. They, if you try to implement something and try to achieve a global goal, what what's happening locally actually might be something totally different. Or by doing something on a local scale, you might actually be contributing to achieving um, global goals, and you might actually not realize that at the moment. And in the third point much more concrete activity as well is shaping the natural asset science policy landscape. So we see a clear place um, of the natural assets can the research and science being advanced there to help support the IPBES assessments and also work with the CBD to contribute to the post-2020 targets. That's all for me. I'm happy to take questions later on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cornelia, um, for your presentation. Um, after Dr. Cornelia Krug, um, we have Sophie Paradis joining us from Montreal, from WWF Canada. And I am just going to take a moment here to transfer her the presenter controls. As she's getting set up there. Um, Cornelia, I was very excited to have you join us here today, um, coming from the Natural Assets Can, and just really um, excited to hear how your presentation was, was really developing how linked urban spaces and biodiversity and ecosystems are, and how um, really important it is to embrace a, a holistic view and engage with different epistemological sets um, as we do that and as we go forward. So thank you so much for bringing up those points here. I hope we can have a good discussion on it later. Um, Sophie, are you ready to go ahead? Um, thanks, Melissa. Well, it's a real pleasure to present uh, to all of you our project in Montreal. And excuse my voice, I have a, a cold in May, I don't know why. Uh, so, um, and it's very useful to listen to the other panelists because it's kind of helping us in our project in Montreal. So today I just want to show you quickly what we are doing at WWF in Canada. As you know, WWF is an international uh, angle and we have different, of course, um, mission and project on field, but also uh, we all work together on the same big topic like Arctic, freshwater, science, research and innovation. So we just launched uh, last year the first uh, Living Planet report on biodiversity and the decline of biodiversity in Canada. And unfortunately, the situation is not better than in the rest of the world. Uh, we are working on ocean, the three ocean. We are lucky in Canada because we have a lot, a lot of uh, water and forest, but we also are responsible to taking care of it. And in Quebec, it's quite different. It's a territory pro program. So we are working on um, urban biodiversity, uh, as we have a project, it's a hub. Uh, Biopolis, it's the first urban biodiversity hub in North America. So please go on biopolis.ca and you will be uh, able to see community project linked to urban biodiversity, but also science document and municipal boroughs planning that uh, we want to connect and broke silos between um, these important people who are also uh, in charge of urban biodiversity with our dynamic community in Montreal. Blue Montreal is the project that I, I want to show you today, uh, linked to urban rivers. And the St. Lawrence River in Quebec, it's like in our DNA. <laughs> we are so linked, so connected to our St. Lawrence River. So there's a lot of uh, things going on there. So we are working more in a big conservation, uh, traditional way to protect belugas and also to be aware about the impact of shipping in our biodiversity. So Blue Montreal. Montreal is an island. And uh, well, a few years ago, maybe 100 years ago, we had those all rivers in this island, small and larger one. Uh, and what we want to do for Montreal is bringing back those rivers or those small uh, creeks uh, in our urban area for many purposes. 
uh, for the resilience of this, the resilience of the, uh, the city of Montreal. Uh, you know, as me, that climate change are really impactful for cities. Uh, floating is one of the biggest challenge that city has to look at, and also to bring back aquatic. Uh, urban biodiversity. We also we we often talk about you know bees and trees and flowers and indigenous species, but we of, we we often forget that we have fishes around Montreal. It's an island, and we have more than eighty eight fish species uh, around the island. So that is what we want to do. Um, and uh, we, I will present you the, the, the study that we did too. So the way that we want to bring back water into uh, Montreal is daylighting. Daylighting is opening, uh, you know, that 100 years ago, maybe 60 years ago, depends on the city or the borough. Uh, Water or rivers of work canalized were put on in, under underneath under uh, uh, under um, underground uh, to uh, manage hygiene uh, to manage the development of our city. So we want to bring back to open those pipes uh, where water still is and rivers still flow. Um, we want to, when it's not possible to daylight rivers, we want to build some new urban rivers and blue alleys. It's you may be aware, uh, all of you aware about green alleys, but it's possible also to have blue alleys. So manage water in our backyard. This project um, it's the reality for everybody, for university, for angles like us, for anybody now to have collaborators. We all work in small teams and we also want to, to, to expand our knowledge and expertise and to share expertise with other people. Uh, for example, in Montreal, we want to, uh, well, in fact, we, we approach some First Nation, uh, artist, uh, historical, uh, historian people to, to just know better about those great rivers that we we just put underground. So Blue Montreal, uh, we already contact and work with local actors, uh, boroughs, um, other little engos in Montreal, citizen groups, businesses, First Nation, and we want to bring them uh, all around the table around uh, a river. Universities, for sure, we are working now with the uh, University of Montréal and Lucam, which is University of Quebec and Montréal, um, for their precise expertise on uh, aquatic biodiversity and also for the work on um, daylighting uh, and, you know, mapping those ancient rivers. So the methodology that we used to uh, do the first opportunity study, uh, we, in fact, last year we started to um, to, to, to work on an opportunity study. Uh, we look at the local redevelopment planning from each borough that we uh, we identify. Which bo each borough were identified by was identified by. Um, sustainable development criteria, so like social criteria, is there a school in this area, um, urban, uh, urban heat uh, highland, so is that, is, is that a good thing that a river can bring, bring back in those precise area. Also, we, um, we wanted to know what are the local action or the project that we can link to, not redo uh, stuff because we don't have the, 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 the capacities to do this, but what is going on on the field and what we can bring to, to daylight rivers uh, with, um, with, uh, with them. Uh, we, well, we also choose dense and highly urbanized areas just because bringing back those rivers uh, and studies showed us that bringing back water in uh, some areas bring back biodiversity. So we want to connect people with their own nature. Um, I was telling you that we are working on belugas, but in urban areas, and I think this is the case for a lot of cities around the world, um, well, we have issues, not issues, but 
the, the harmony between raccoons and coyotes and squirrels and skunks in Montreal are not the best, um, you know, it's not a perfect harmony between <laughs> the community or the human and the fauna. So we want to use uh, urban biodiversity and our expertise and urban, highly urbanized uh, area to show that, yes, species exist in urban areas and we have to love them or at least to know them better and not uh, because we are also on their territories. So we did, I will just show you some example of what it can look like because it's not um, daylighting or new urban rivers is not a, f a new thing in the world. Uh, a lot of country like China, uh, like Seoul, um, South Korea already did this. So some example of urban rivers, we have here an example uh, in uh, Shanghai. So they keep it and the water is going there. Uh, another way to uh, to manage water, to, 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 to think about water in our planning is the storm water management. Very useful, as you know, when it's time to talk about flooding in our cities. Uh, some water garden and urban river, blue alleys. This is a way that we can do blue alleys. And the biggest and the, 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 the more important uh, infrastructure work that we want to do is the lighting river. So uh, I was saying that it's not the first time we saw those projects in Yonkers, uh, in New York State, in United States. Seal is the most well-known, um, the most you know, the star of daylighting rivers in the world. Vancouver um, and other cities in Canada did a little bit of daylighting. It's not huge as we want to do in Montreal, but small project to see what is possible to do. And I just want to show you those projects, um, how beautiful it can be in a city and how, you know, um, hurtful and very helpful it is to be to have a river back in your city. So the first pictures are um, is the project of Seoul. What they did, it was a highway. They just removed um, 12 lanes of the highway and they put back a river over there. It was the first project kind of this kind in the world, um, a huge project also. I'm, I'm not telling you that it's perfect, but for sure, Urban uh, biodiversity, they have data and showing that um, it's coming back and rapidly. And it's good also for the, um, you know, the sustainable development of this area. Uh, below, it's the project of um, the sawmill rivers in Yonkers uh, in the United States. So it was a parking lot and the river was, uh, you know, was under this parking lot and they just decided to reopen it and now this area is vibrant it's economical uh, economically sustainable because they recreate those little uh, common place where people can get and can live and it's beautiful to be there so uh, rapidly, if this is the map of the watershed that we work on uh, with um, Valérie Maou from uh, the Université de Montréal, and uh, just to be sure that our approach, our thinking is based on watershed. Um, this is also another, uh, another example uh, in Laval, it's up north Montreal. And this is the work of uh, Beatrix Besnard from UCAM. And she just worked on small, small, um, you know, uh, rivers and just, you know, rehabilitate the, the, the space for the bi urban biodiversity, the aquatic urban biodiversity. And she was telling us that uh, uh, in six months, she was able to see the return of biodiversity uh, from insects, um, fishes, uh, little birds. So it was uh, very easy to see that give the biodiversity a space and they will take it. So the Montreal, uh, I told you that we, um, we uh, studied five potential boroughs. And uh, so it's very the center of Montreal, as you can see, very where it's highly urbanized. Um, just because it's where we 
we were able to see reverse the potential of the boroughs and also a vibrant community in, this, in their boroughs. Um, so actually, we have the support of local groups uh, because we want to have their support and collaboration and also the um, elected um, people from those three boroughs in Montreal. And we needed their support to go further to do um, a feasibility studies and uh, for each borough because we, um, we, we, we highlight some potential sites. So um, community and uh, municipal government are on board with us. And that is fantastic because they are thrilled and really inspired by this, uh, this project to bring back rivers in Montreal. Thanks a lot. That's it for me. Thank you so much, Sophie. That was a great, great presentation of a really important local example of um, how important these uh, these strong connections and partnerships that you're developing with different area universities, the cities and other communities that are so important to have involved in these initiatives. So thank you so much for the presentation. Um, now we're moving on to Joshua Stack, who's joining us from New York and just transfer the presenter controls to him. He'll be setting them up momentarily. Um, and again, just to remind you all in the audience, feel free as the uh, presenters are going through their presentations to leave comments and questions in the chat box for us. And we'll be taking those up at the end of the webinar after the presentations. So um, Josh, if you are ready, you can take it away. I am, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, great. It appears that, uh, can you still see that toolbar on the bottom? Yes, I can. Uh, okay, I apologize for that. Um, I'll go ahead and proceed since we are uh, moving along on time uh, relatively well. So my name is Josh Stack. I am certainly grateful as the other, other panelists to be a part of this. Um, I'm especially grateful for this global community of researchers and scientists because I am very much immersed in practice. Um, I joke that I'm a recovering attorney and I haven't quite figured out what I'd like to do next, but being in practice, it's very humbling to intervene in complex adaptive systems through design in a way, you know, using research and a process in a way that you hope does good, maybe not just less bad, that enhances biodiversity rather than simply slows its loss. And for uh, my practice, which involves mostly working with universities and cities in the human built environment, it, it's nowhere more evident to me when we move a bulldozer on a site for even a US Green Building Council lead platinum project, that that project can ultimately result at the end in a loss of uh, biodiversity, in a loss of ecosystem function, a loss of even social and cultural function. And so 15 years ago, uh, we tried to look a bit differently at it to say, is there any science-based framework that we can apply to design that gives us a verifiable and quantifiable result that we can utilize on projects? And so as we went forward from that existing model of practice for sustainability, that really essentially the first step is to scrape all life off a site using heavy equipment, petroleum driven, and then thereafter constructing some vision or some belief of what sustainability might be. Um, you know, we began to research in the resilient science community. So very grateful for the Resilience Alliance and that global community. Also um, traditional ecological knowledge. And I'll talk about a case study here in the next few slides in terms of where we found RTA TEK for this site. And then also biomimicry, which um, you know, essentially looks functionally at life as mentor, model, and measure. Um, certainly different uh, varieties of biomimicry exist. Um, biomimetics versus biomimicry are very different design processes. But ultimately, as we tried to apply this research and practice, we found a common framework in terms of first remembering what the historical ecology or the historical social ecological system may have looked like. Second, recognizing that you're under a reality of budget and schedule generally for even um, you know, projects like the one I'll talk about next. How can you evaluate what exists today relative to what was there and, and look at in terms of not some pre-development baseline or some fixed point in time, but some sense of historic holocentic continuity between our past 
present and future. And then third, really the, the design process of how do you deliberate on these projects and, and design and construct something that you know will have profound and persistent and lasting uh, biophysical consequences. So I can, there we go. So this is the near west side, Syracuse, New York. Uh, it was a project that came to us, about a hundred million dollar project led by a local university. And that's essentially a characteristic uh, upstate New York City, post-industrial, um, you can see the factories just outside the downtown core. And so the university looked at it as a way to re revitalize the city through design, sustainability, art, and a variety of other assumptions. And so we were asked in terms of what would sustainable design look like for this site? And so the first thing we did with our process was remember. And so we looked back through historical records. We talked to the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Onondaga Nation, which about 20 miles south, who has deliberated for the seventh generation in this system for more than the past 1,000 years. So that image on the screen is a painting from the faith keeper of the Onondaga clan, Warren Lyons. And so he talks about the great law of peace. And in that great law of peace, which is very much an organizing law, much like a U.S. constitution um, is, that sets forth our, our form of governance, um, key in their, in their great law of peace is the idea and really the requirement they deliberate for the seventh generation to come. And so from a design perspective, that's quite a humbling endeavor to try to envision what the world might look like seven generations from now. But in conversations with uh, Oren, he said it's actually that when the clan mothers and, and the, the chiefs uh, gather, what they're actually doing is first remembering the world of their grandparents. And then once they remember the tradition, that traditional ecological knowledge, the tradition of uh, enduring adaptation to place, then they begin to deliberate what the world of their grandchildren might look like. And we saw some commonality between that and say C.S. Howling's work in terms of how nature test transfers and, and stores experience at different scales of uh, time and place. And so in the background there, that photo is the Hotel Truax. That's a 12.4 million pound luxury hotel that existed within that system, that near west side that I showed you. In 1920, the builders actually lifted that 12.4 million pound hotel off its original stone foundation, rolled it across the street, spun it 180 degrees and set it back down. And during that whole process, the hotel never actually closed. Guests continued to check in and out and enjoy dinner and hot showers and everything else you might imagine in 1920s luxury in upstate New York. And so that was part of our history, part of the tradition of our cultural services in this system. However, we forgot because less than 20 years after the builders had actually moved that across the street, it was demolished to make way for a parking lot and an urban revitalization initiative. So we were asked to intervene on the near west side and in the second step, evaluating what's there today, there's generally a legacy of toxic industrial, um, you know, PCBs and building caulk, asbestos. These homes were viewed as safety hazards, as fire risks, as a cost that should be demolished as quickly as possible. But we looked at it from a different perspective. Again, um, another researcher, Robin Kimmerer, who's also a clan mother of the Potawatomi, talks about reciprocal restoration. And we asked if these houses could be opportunities in a way that could mutually enhance both uh, biological diversity, but also cultural diversity in terms of deconstructing and salvaging and reusing them. And so this house we actually deconstructed in about a day. It took about 10 hours. We worked with a local gang member who, in his words, wasn't uh, trying to create this uh, fancy resilience initiative as I was, but he was recycling kids who would have otherwise found their way into the same gang that he was. And he had changed his life because he had a daughter and he wanted to make a better world for her and his world was this place and these buildings were his way. And so we worked with him, salvaged about 86% of this house um, in just over the span of a few days, dispelled a lot of notions that memory of the Hotel Truex was lost to the local community and, and most local decision makers were very much afraid to even put one person on the roof, let alone trainees who had, who had come through almost a prison work release program um, to, to do this work. So we realized very quickly, though, uh, when you try to intervene at the nature-based solution or an ecosystem scale, biomimicry, whatever the framework might be, it, it's very difficult to do it at a single scale. 
that yellow circle is where that house was in the previous slide. And so we worked with researchers at SUNY ESF, Dr. Myrna Hall and others who digitized the, historic, the historical um, ecology of that area um, into the current street grid. And so what we thereafter did was look at ecosystem biomimicry as the design process to try to set standards in land use law, zoning, and community planning so we could write a, a code based on ecological function that any house or building or site would have to meet. And that's where Jeanine Benius and others talk about the city that functions as a forest. Uh, we looked at the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment uh, set of ecosystem services as our baseline. And so what we've tried to do is, biomimicry would call it uh, generous cities, but we're trying to use ecology in that social ecological system, uh, not as a restoration project. We're not trying to recreate that hemlock swamp that you see in the background, but what we're trying to do is somehow preserve that historic continuity of what that neighborhood existed as 200, as early as 200 years ago, which was this brilliantly biodiverse mosaic of wetland and, and freshwater ecosystems, inland marshes and, and salt marshes. It's really amazing, brilliantly biodiverse system that the Haudenosaunee, through their great law of peace, well understood for more than a thousand years not to disrupt or intervene in the ecological productivity of that system. That system to them was a key source of survival, health, abundance, and prosperity. It was only when European settlers came in, they basically, uh, you know, historical records would show drain the swamp to create a salt industry. And, um, and much of that function was lost. And so now more than 200 years later, intervening, in this system, trying to understand exactly how uh, we could do that in ways. And so that's where we use these ecological performance standards in land use law and zoning. And so at the bottom, just to conclude, are some of the different design interventions that we've utilized and work with others in, in this design community to actually achieve these standards today. So as aspirational as they may seem, they're certainly um, pragmatic and, and able to be constructed today to meet the pace of the market and demand and that build out that Oliver referenced the 300 million people in the next 12 years. Um, these are solutions that are essentially ready to go in there. So with that, I would just say thank you. Thank you so much, Josh, for your presentation. I know we are a little bit over time for this webinar, um, but we do have one last presentation. And um, if you all uh, that have attended today don't mind just spending another 15 minutes with us here in celebration of World Biodiversity Day, I'd like to bring uh, Dr. Rob McDonald here. Um, he's going to be presenting on a very interesting project, co-design project um, that is ongoing in the Urban Knowledge Action Network now. I've transferred him the presenter controls and he'll Hi. just now to get situated. Yeah, um, all right. So thank you all for hanging on to the end and I'll try to be brief in my remarks. Can everybody see my, um, my slides now? Yeah, we can see your slides, Rob. Perfect. Um, so I'm gonna try to do three things quickly. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the Nature Conservancy and its urban program and how it might link to the urban can. I want to tell you a bit about um, mostly my research in this space that's relevant for, for World Biodiversity Day. And then I want to tell you more about the assessment that uh, is just getting started called Nature in the Urban Century because it's a prime opportunity for everyone on this call to uh, participate and, and interact. So for the Nature Conservancy, our work in cities started uh, maybe 30 years ago now in Chicago, uh, in the picture you see, and we were one of the founding members of this group, Chicago Wilderness, that thought about open space and, and planning um, in cities. And for us, as a traditionally a land trust, this was a, a natural outgrowth of what we did, planning where nature should be protected in urban regions. Um, and from that, we've grown to a really big urban program that in some places is still focused on open space planning and protection, but really also spans the gamut of uh, nature-based solutions or, or natural infrastructure or whatever term you want to use um, from urban uh, stormwater green infrastructure projects, similar to what Sophie was talking about in Montreal, uh, that's very common in the U.S., to projects around coastal resilience and um, 
using wetlands and, and mangroves and, and oyster reefs to reduce coastal hazards. That's really common uh, in the east coast of the U.S. and the west coast of the U.S. to projects to protect water security. Um, so that whole gamut we work on. And um, I wanted to, to throw this out to the, the Urban Can that one way I would love to interact with Urban Can members is as scientific resources and collaborators in these particular um, projects. So in my remarks today, I'm going to kind of be reflecting on this broad network of cities where we work and trying to think about how do you leverage knowledge um, to action in these particular particular cities. Um, so just some context before we get into um, some of my research in this space. Um, Oliver mentioned the, the incredibly dramatic pace of urban growth. We are building roughly a city the size of New York or, or Tokyo every seven weeks. Uh, that's, that's the pace of growth. There'll be two billion new people in cities by, uh, by 2050, uh, which if you believe Karen Sito's forecast, that's around 120 million hectares of new urban area. Uh, so if you push that all together, it covers uh, the size of, say, the state of Texas in the U.S. It's a huge chunk of the Earth's land surface. And I think we know from, from case studies and research that if that growth is unplanned, there could be some quite significant impacts on biodiversity. So already around 15% of species have been impacted, that's terrestrial vertebrates, and the forecasts are that the impact may, may double if we don't plan that growth well. There's also an increased discussion on how what that would mean for people if we uh, plan these city, cities badly, if we don't think about how to incorporate nature into those cities. Um, and this discussion uh, maybe has the most resonance right now around climate change and, and resilience. Um, there's a lot of focus in the cities we talk with on getting ready for climate change. Um, uh, so, so that's a, another danger if we don't plan well. Uh, and so <clears throat> there is this unique moment in the next decade or two where most of these big new cities, big new neighborhoods will be built. Um, more than 90 trillion in public infrastructure over the next, public and private, over the next 15 years. That's WRI's estimate, I think. Um, and in just the next couple years, Oliver hinted at this in his remarks, there'll be some really significant public sector investment in both um, biodiversity conservation, per se, relevant to the goal of, of CBD, but also to climate adaptation. So it is a moment for scientists in the urban can to start um, bringing their knowledge into to policy. And so I'm excited you all are, are there. Um, on screen now is some work I've done with Karen Sito's lab at Yale. And one of the things we've been trying to understand is, well, where is that geography um, of urban growth and biodiversity impact? Uh, where are those, those key places where um, conservationists really need to pay the most attention? So very quickly, the two panels on the left, the top panel shows um, a measure of how much natural habitat um, has been lost or will be lost to urban growth in the next 30 years. Uh, again, if those cities are not planned well. And the bottom panel is one measure of biodiversity importance. This is uh, vertebrate endemism. Um, so darker colors are, are higher areas of endemism. So what you find is that there's a realistic chance that 13% uh, of terrestrial endemics may be imperiled or go extinct because of this urban growth. And that's actually an outsized impact given the, the land area cities take up, but cities tend to be along coastlines and, and islands, kind of high biodiversity areas. The, the good news for conservationists, I guess, is that um, biodiversity losses or potential biodiversity losses are quite concentrated. So in those 30 um, purple dots in the bottom panel, um, those contain um, about four out of every five endemics that are threatened. So the conservationists and groups like TNC or WWF can focus some of our efforts in these, these key places where we have to get urbanization right to protect biodiversity. One caveat there, though, is many of these uh, purple dots, if you look at where those, those places are located, are in developing countries where governance, um, governance capacity may be a little more limited. And so the classic strategy that TNC used in Chicago, for example, of we're gonna do an urban plan and then try to implement it, gets much harder. Um, and there's a real need to work with uh, stakeholders, governments, and, and communities in developing countries to 
find solutions that can protect biodiversity in their particular governance context. So uh, very quickly, you all know there's this huge gamut of benefits from nature um, that, that matter for cities. We've already talked about stormwater today, and um, a lot of my work recently has been on reducing the urban heat island, for example. So one theme of my work is just trying to add up those benefits and make the case to cities that uh, net um, investing in street trees or parks uh, is a benefit for society, so that the benefits to society outweigh the, the costs. And I cited here one good study in, in California, where I am happen to be sitting right now, uh, that for every dollar spent in California on street trees, you're getting close to $6 back uh, in benefits to society. So that's a phenomenal rate of return. A lot of my research recently has been on um, the role trees and parks play in either cleaning, cooling the air, so uh, one of our literature reviews showed that uh, on average, a row of street trees in cities re reduces particulate matter by 7 to 24 percent. That's the interquartile range of a bunch of studies. And it reduces summer temperatures by 1 to 2 degrees Celsius. Um, so by no means does, do trees solve either of these problems, both serious public health problems um, and both exacerbated by climate change. But they help, and they're a cost-effective tool in the toolbox of cities. Uh, and I, I put a link on this slide. I would encourage everyone to check out this report because we have uh, estimates for more than 200 cities around the world of uh, the benefits nature is providing in particular neighborhoods in those cities. All right, so on to my last point. Um, we are launching uh, Future Earth and, and the Nature Conservancy and Stockholm Resilience Center and all those groups on the bottom uh, bullet point, are launching what we're calling the Nature in the Urban Century Assessment. And this is done at the request of um, CBD member nations who came together in Cancun at one of the last meetings and said, look, urban growth is one of the largest drivers of biodiversity loss, but it's one that's not adequately dealt with right now in um, international policy. Uh, there's historically been more of a focus in the convention on rural drivers of, of uh, loss, uh, like logging and agriculture, which are of course important, but in this urban century, we also have to get urban growth right. So a lot of us are trying to now bring together evidence for a particular targeted purpose. Uh, so I would contrast the goal of this assessment a little bit with the urban can. The urban can is a long-term effort where you're, you're trying to bring in lots of people. In this particular assessment, we're trying to marshal information um, specifically on where urban growth could compromise natural habitats that are important for biodiversity or, or for climate adaptation, and then connect that to a couple specific policy windows that we want to influence. Uh, so we are in the midst of phase one, the sort of the science part of this assessment, um, and we will have a, a first white paper, we hope, by the November 2018 meeting of CBD, uh, outlining, look, here are some priority places in countries uh, where the world has to get urban growth right to protect nature for, for people and biodiversity. In phase two, there's going to be collaborative, locally led planning efforts in at least some of those priority areas, um, dependent on, on funding and sort of the willingness of, of cities and governments to work. In phase three, we do hope that there's some real um, funding for implementation of these plans through mechanisms like the Global Environmental Facility and the Green Carbon Fund, and also new national commitments to CBD. And then finally, in phase four, we hope we take those lessons of, of collaborative planning that, that led to real action on the ground and share them with a much broader network of thousands of cities through ICLEI um, or, or indeed through the CBD itself. So uh, I listed some emails on, on the bottom bullet here. Please contact one of us if you'd love to, if, if we would love more people to be involved in this, this assessment. So with that, I will stop uh, and pass back to Melissa. Thank you so much, Rob. Um, thank you so much for introducing that exciting project. And again, just to echo what Rob said, yes, please do reach out and contact one of us. Um, we would really like to have as many people involved uh, as possible in the project. So thank you so much for that. I know that we are over time, um, but we do have a number of exciting questions and comments that have come up in the chat box. Um, we won't have time to go over all of them today, but I would like to go through a few of them. Um, I've pulled out uh, one for uh, three of the presenters here. So we'll 
but we'll go over three and then um, at the end of the webinar I will send all of the questions that were posted in the chat box to the presenter and panelists that they were directed to so that you can get your answer by email afterwards. Um, so for those of you that can join us for um, a brief question period here, um, I thought that I would begin with um, Irma Verhoeven has asked a question directed at Cornelia. Um, Irma, if you would like to read out your question, I'll unmute you now. Um, and you can read the question to uh, Cornelia uh, if you can use your microphone. Irma? Okay. She might have not have the, the ability to use her microphone, so I can just read out what was uh, posted there in the chat box. So Cornelia, this question is for you. Um, Irma has asked, what is the difference between natural assets and ecosystem services, and, and why is it important to make this distinction between the two? So um, natural assets actually go, I think, beyond ecosystem services. So ecosystem services will be derived from, from ecosystems, from biodiversity. But when we're looking at natural assets, it actually goes beyond just the biodiversity and ecosystems aspects of the environment. So we're considering the abiotic factors as well. So I think that's the main, main distinction that we have. But ecosystem services in our understanding are, are part of the natural assets. I hope that helps. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Cornelia. Um, the next question. My apologies, um, there was a complication here on my side. I hope you all can hear me now. Um, I was reading out the question list uh, that were written in the chat box and the comment. Um, I think you probably missed all of the introductions that I made. So uh, following from uh, Rob's presentation, I was uh, really just pointing on how there's a number of questions that were put in the question box. And since we don't have very much time today, I would still like to go over a few of them uh, here with everyone. So the um, second question here was from uh, Nikki. 
Uh, Nikki, if you can respond, it was uh, how can you engage different levels of government um, who might have different objectives uh, in the co-creation process? And then on that, how can you facilitate um, co-creation opportunities with those different levels of government? Uh, thank you. Um, in terms of the different levels of government, uh, what we have done is to break down the process in terms of first organize co-creation within the different levels like with local government and then with regional and then with national and then have this cross-scale co-creation synergy moments so what we have done in a number of projects is to actually make this crossover uh, workshops that actually you start with by showing what are the main outputs and outcomes for the level-based uh, co-creation engagement processes. So what are the convergence points, like similar agenda elements, similar outputs, and what are the outputs that can be further integrated and uh, coordinated, and focus the agenda of these cross-scale co-creation workshops on these. In terms of how you facilitate, um, I have to say we have tried different different ways. You can hire professional facilitators. You can ask intermediaries to actually facilitate these co-creation workshops. Um, it strongly depends on the, I have to say, sociocultural context. Uh, sometimes also researchers are very good in the role of uh, facilitating these co-creation processes. Uh, frequently seen as independent uh, and unbiased um, contributors. Um, yeah, I suggest these are really like good design questions for co-creation and they need to always be considered. Okay, thank you, Nikki, for that. That question was from Leslie Mabon. Um, the next question that I have here is from Mohammed Ibrahim. Um, Mohammed, I see you're still on the line. I can unmute you here if you'd like to go ahead. This question is directed at Sophie. Um, Mohammed, can you hear us? Yeah, okay, thank you very much. Uh, I was actually, I mean, just um, interested in knowing if um, there is any consideration for, um, since they are, their projects are looking at rehabilitating rivers and then also making sure that uh, the introduction of biodiversity into the urban sphere. So. Uh, are there considerations about biosecurity related issues and and some form of uh, invasive species related management uh, uh, preparedness for for the, for such projects thank okay, you Sophie, would you like to go ahead and respond yes thanks mohammed for your question so um yes of course all our projects uh, even for biopolis how we selected them or for blue montreal or for any project that we have as to we are working on indigenous spaces and invasive spaces also um and uh, that is how we work, we have to look and study with our collaborators on those one. And is there another part of your question? I'm not sure if I, I, I hear in it that well. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. I just wanted to know that, I mean, since and then you've really mentioned a very important point with regards to the fact that, I mean, there is, um, you are mindful, I mean, software, those products are mindful of, um, biosecurity issues and I mean which can arise when you have um, when you are introducing either species that are not um, uh, have, have been away for some time and, and some some of those issues so thank you I'm good thank you Okay, so I think it sounds like, um, Sophie, your, your answer really got at Mohammed's question. Um, we also have a, a raised hand here from Michael Armstrong. I can go ahead and unmute you, Michael, if you'd like to go ahead and question. Michael. 
Oh, okay. So, um, anyways, um, so from there on, we really are leading up to 11 o'clock right now, ED time, um, almost at the top of the hour. So there are quite a number of questions left um, in the chat box, but we don't have time today to pick up any others. Uh, but like I said, I will be directing all of those questions to the panelists and speakers that um, the comments and questions were referring to, so they can respond to you from there um, from email. Um, to close the webinar, I'd just again like to say thank you to all of you. I'm really happy that you decided to spend sort of this first um, hour of your days and, and ends of your days here with us to celebrate World Biodiversity Day. It's the second webinar in the Urban Knowledge Action Network series. Our next webinar uh, will be hosted on World Population Day, which is July 11th. So pay attention to the open network and you will have more information about the exciting lineup of speakers that we'll have for World Population Day. So again, thank you very much for joining us today and enjoy the rest of your days. Goodbye. <laughs>